The General Assembly of the United Nations continued debating the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan today. Moscow's ambassador to the UN, Oleg Troyanovsky, delivered a long speech in which he charged American politicians and leaders in Peking are artificially heating up the so-called Afghan situation, as he put it, so they can turn the wheel of international affairs backward to times of enmity and military hysteria. But Troyanovsky also predicted that detente will survive the current crisis. That's what the Soviet ambassador said. But ABC News diplomatic correspondent Ted Koppel has learned the Soviets are soon likely to follow an entirely different course. Here is his report. U.S. intelligence analysts now believe that there is imminent danger of some kind of Soviet military action into northwestern Pakistan. Some intelligence reports indicate that the action will take place in less than a month. What is anticipated is not so much an invasion of Pakistan, but rather hot pursuit across the Durand Line, the international boundary between Afghanistan and Pakistan, to strike against concentrations of Afghan insurgents who are using northwestern Pakistan as a sanctuary. The United States does have a bilateral agreement with Pakistan, the terms of which were spelled out by President Carter last week. If they are threatened from an outside force, for instance the Soviet Union, that we would uh, consult with them and take action, including military action if necessary, to uh, protect Pakistan. One important round in that process of consultation is due to take place tomorrow when Pakistan's foreign affairs advisor, Aga Shahi, comes here to the State Department to meet with Secretary Vance. It is most unlikely that the United States would respond to hot pursuit by the Soviets into Pakistan as though it were an invasion, but the precise nature of a U.S. response is being kept deliberately vague. Administration officials did reveal today that since the Soviets first entered Afghanistan, they have sustained between 900 and 1,200 casualties. These same officials also reveal that after several hundred political prisoners were released from jail in Kabul the other day, 300 of those prisoners were rearrested and executed. Ted Koppel, ABC News, at the State Department. One pressure being felt by Pakistan and by Iran on the western border is that of new refugees. The fighting has pushed thousands of Afghanistanis across both borders. At Zabal in eastern Iran, they bring stories and occasional evidence of the Soviet-backed offensive. A rocket, they say, was fired from a helicopter at rebel Afghanistani tribesmen. A man who says he was injured while the man with him was killed. Afghanistanis have historically wandered back and forth across the borders here. Rebel tribesmen and their pitiful minor weapons are no surprise here, even though Iran has been less than enthusiastic in support of the anti-Soviet forces. The pro-Soviet government in Afghanistan today released 126 political prisoners. It wasn't enough. Thousands of Afghanistanis stormed Kabul's main prison in a bid to free others. Two people were killed when the guards opened fire. With more on the situation in Afghanistan, in Kabul, here's Greg Dobbs. Around the country, insurgents have captured their first provincial capital, a city in the northeast. A tremendous psychological blow to the government. And elsewhere, also according to Western diplomatic sources, guerrillas are mining highways and inflicting real harm on the Russians. Barely two weeks into his Soviet-assisted presidency, Babrak Karmal yesterday met newsmen. Friendly newsmen asked questions like, what are the prospects for relations between Russia and Afghanistan? Western or so-called opposition reporters asked somewhat harder questions. Why was President Amin deposed and killed? The answer, because he was working with American imperialists. Proof, said Karmal, will soon be given. Another question, how long will the Russian troops stay? They will leave Afghanistan upon the moment that the aggressive policy of the United States in compliance with Peking leadership and the provocation of the reactionary circles of Pakistan, Egypt, and Saudi Arabia is eliminated. Today, Great Britain's ambassador was called home for consultation. Now, in diplomatic language, that's a slap at the Afghan government. The German and French ambassadors here already are gone. The American ambassador was killed nearly a year ago and hasn't been replaced. Greg Dobbs, ABC News, in Kabul, Afghanistan. In the Soviet Union today, an agriculture official acknowledged the United States grain embargo will hurt. 
Speaking on television, he said that some farmers did not have enough fodder to feed their cattle and poultry. Our correspondent in Moscow is Charles Bierbauer. Tonight, he reports on American businessmen there and the president's embargo. Good. Have you received your notice about breakfast tomorrow morning? The American businessmen were up in the Moscow pre-dawn, hoping for information as just how deeply the Carter measures will cut into their trade with the Soviets. Nearly two dozen of them got orange juice, coffee, and sweet rolls, but the American embassy's commercial office could not serve them much information. It hadn't been shipped. Well, I'm sure they're going to have to come out with a clarification later on today. Some of these American companies are looking at multi-million dollar contracts that could rebound into foreign competitors' accounts because of the wall of restrictions President Carter is building. The Moscow-based businessmen are uniformly reluctant to talk about their position, either under orders from home offices or because they do not want to offend the Soviets. The nearly 30 American businesses with full-time Moscow offices operate in tough conditions at the best of times. Most companies have invested here in hopes of reaching potentially big Soviet markets. But last year, industrial trade with the Soviets, excluding agriculture, was only $700 million. Part of that could even be lost if export licenses already issued are revoked. The American businessmen have mixed personal feelings about President Carter's actions. Some feel a response is necessary to be made to the Soviets. But businessmen being businessmen, they see German, Japanese, and other competitors ready to jump at their contracts. One obviously disgruntled businessman says the Americans are spiting their face because of high moral principles. Charles Bierbauer, ABC News, Moscow. Yesterday, Vice President Mondale said the Summer Olympics should be moved from Moscow, perhaps to Munich or Montreal because of the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. Today, Canada's Prime Minister Joe Clark said he too questions the appropriateness of holding the games in Moscow and will take the lead in discussing alternative sites with other countries. Clark said he has already talked with the mayor of Montreal about moving the games there. In addition, Clark announced a series of measures similar to those of the United States in cutting back trade with the Soviet Union, including holding the line on grain exports.